Chapter 4. This is Pure Religion. Pure Religion Defined What is pure religion? Christ has told us that pure religion is the exercise of pity, sympathy, and love in the home, in the church, and in the world. This is the kind of religion to teach to the children and is the genuine article. Teach them that they are not to center their thoughts upon themselves, but that wherever there is human need and suffering, there is a field for missionary work. Review and Herald, November 12, 1895. Pure religion and undefiled before the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Good deeds are the fruit that Christ requires us to bear. Kind words, deeds of benevolence, of tender regard for the poor, the needy, the afflicted. When hearts sympathize with hearts, burdened with discouragement and grief, when the hand dispenses to the needy, when the naked are clothed, the stranger made welcome to a seat in your parlor and a place in your heart, angels are coming very near, and an answering strain is responded to in heaven. Testimonies, Volume 2, page 25. God's Test of Our Religion I have been shown some things in reference to our duty to the unfortunate, which I feel it my duty to write at this time. I saw that it is in the providence of God that widows and orphans, the blind, the deaf, the lame, and persons afflicted in a variety of ways have been placed in close Christian relationship to his church. It is to prove his people and to develop their true character. Angels of God are watching to see how we treat these persons who need our sympathy, love, and disinterested benevolence. This is God's test of our character. If we have the true religion of the Bible, we shall feel that a debt of love, kindness, and interest is due to Christ in behalf of his brethren. And we can do no less than to show our gratitude for his immeasurable love to us, while we were sinners unworthy of his grace, by having a deep interest and unselfish love for those who are our brethren and who are less fortunate than ourselves. Testimonies, Volume 3, page 511. How does your light shine? Those who should have been the light of the world have shed forth but feeble and sickly beams. What is light? It is piety, goodness, truth, mercy, love. It is the revealing of the truth in the character and life. The gospel is dependent on the personal piety of its believers for its aggressive power, and God has made provision through the death of his beloved Son that every soul may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Review and Herald, March 24, 1891. The Sign Distinguishing True and False Religion True sympathy between man and his fellow man is to be the sign distinguishing those who love and fear God from those who are unmindful of his law. How great the sympathy that Christ expressed in coming to this world to give his life a sacrifice for a dying world. His religion led to the doing of genuine medical missionary work. He, he was a healing power. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, he said. This is the test that the great author of truth used to distinguish between true religion and false. Manuscript 117, 1903. Practical Sympathy, the Test of Purity Satan is playing the game of life for every soul. He knows that practical sympathy is a test of the purity and unselfishness of the heart, and he will make every possible effort to close our hearts to the needs of others, that we may finally be unmoved by the sight of suffering. He will bring in many things to prevent the expression of love and sympathy. It is thus that he ruined Judas. Judas was constantly planning to benefit self. In this, he represents a large class of professed Christians of today. Therefore, we need to study his case. We are as near to Christ as he was. Yet, if, as with Judas, association with Christ does not make us one with him, if it does not cultivate within our hearts a sincere sympathy for those for whom Christ gave his life, we are in the same danger as with Judas of being outside of Christ 
the sport of Satan's temptations. We need to guard against the first deviation from righteousness. For one transgression, one neglect to manifest the Spirit of Christ opens the way for another and still another until the mind is overmastered by the principles of the enemy. If cultivated, the spirit of selfishness becomes a devouring passion which nothing but the power of Christ can subdue. Testimonies, Volume 6, pages 264 and 265. Pure religion is doing deeds of mercy and love. True godliness is measured by the work done. Profession is nothing. Position is nothing. A character like the character of Christ is the evidence we are to bear that God has sent His Son into the world. Those who profess to be Christians, yet do not act as Christ would, were He in their place, greatly injure the cause of God. They misrepresent their Savior and are standing under false colors. Pure and undefiled religion is not a sentiment, but the doing of works of mercy and love. This religion is necessary to health and happiness. It enters the polluted soul temple, and with a scourge drives out the sinful intruders. Taking the throne, it consecrates all by its presence, illuminating the heart with the bright beam of the Son of Righteousness. It opens the windows of the soul heavenward, letting in the sunshine of God's love. With it comes serenity and composure. Physical, mental, and moral strength increase because the atmosphere of heaven is a living, active agency fills the soul. Christ is formed within the hope of glory. Review and Herald, October 15, 1901. To become a toiler, to continue patiently in well-doing, which calls for self-denying labor, is a glorious work which heaven smiles upon. Faithful work is more acceptable to God than the most zealous and thought to be holiest worship. It is working together with Christ that is true worship. Prayers, exhortation, and talk are cheap fruits which are frequently tied on, but fruits that are manifest in good works, in caring for the needy, the fatherless, and widows, are genuine fruits and grow naturally upon a good tree. Testimonies, Volume 2, page 24. Are we the children of God? It is not fitful service that God accepts. It is not emotional spasms of piety that make us children of God. He calls upon us to work for principles that are true, firm, and abiding. If Christ is formed within the hope of glory, He will be revealed in the character. It will be Christ-like. We are to represent Christ to the world as Christ represented the Father. Review and Herald, January 11, 1898. We want to show Christian warmth and hardiness, not as though we were doing some wonderful thing, but just what we would expect any real Christian to do in our own case, were we placed in like circumstances. Letter 68, 1898. Not to be weary in well-doing. Many times our efforts for others may dis be disregarded and apparently lost. But this should be no excuse for us to become weary in well-doing. How often has Jesus come to find fruit upon the plants of his care and found nothing but leaves? We may be disappointed as to the result of our best efforts, but this should not lead us to be indifferent to others' woes and do nothing. Curse Meros, said the angel of the Lord, curse bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not out to help of the Lord to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Testimonies, Volume 3, page 525. In doing for others, we are doing for Christ. From what has been shown me, Sabbath keepers are growing more selfish as they increase in riches. Their love for Christ and His people is decreasing. They do not see the wants of the needy, nor feel their sufferings and sorrows. They do not realize that in neglecting the poor and the suffering they neglect Christ, and that in relieving the wants and sufferings of the poor as far as possible, they minister to Jesus. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, 
and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Matthew twenty five forty one to forty six. Jesus here identifies himself with his suffering people. It was I who was hungry and thirsty. It was I who was a stranger. It was I who was naked. It was I who was sick. It was I who was in prison. When you were enjoying the food from your bountifully spread tables, I was famishing in the hovel or street not far from you. When you closed your doors against me, while your well-furnished rooms were unoccupied, I had not where to lay my head. Your wardrobes were filled with an abundant supply of changeable suits of apparel, upon which means had been needlessly squandered, which you might have given to the needy. I was destitute of comfortable apparel. When you were enjoying health, I was sick. Misfortune cast me into prison and bound me with fetters, bowing down my spirit, depriving me of freedom and hope, while you roamed free. What a oneness Jesus here expresses as existing between himself and his suffering disciples. He makes their case his own. He identifies himself as being in person the very sufferer. Mark, selfish Christian, every neglect of the needy poor, the orphan, the fatherless, is a neglect of Jesus in their person. I am acquainted with persons who make a high profession, whose hearts are so encased in self-love and selfishness that they cannot appreciate what I am writing. They have all their lives thought and lived only for self. To make a sacrifice to do others good, to disadvantage themselves to advantage others, is out of the question with them. They have not the least idea that God requires this of them. Self is their idol. Precious weeks, months, and years pass into eternity, but they have no record in heaven of kindly acts, of sacrificing for others' good, of feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, or taking in the stranger. This entertaining strangers at a venture is not agreeable. If they knew that all who sought to share their bounty were worthy, then they might be induced to do something in this direction. But there is virtue in venturing something. Perchance we may entertain angels. This is taken from volume 2, pages 24 to 26.